we just thought, um, different to the last couple of years, we'd have an opportunity after the table's discussion for direct uh, questions uh, from the floor. So this is really over to you guys. Uh, any burning questions that you have to ask Shane specifically? The Archbishop will be on a panel later with Shane, so we look forward to hearing from you, Archbishop, then in response to questions. But so. Who's going to be the first question asker of Rubicon 2014? And we have a, a mic here. No pressure, no pressure. But uh, yeah, any, any questions. So uh, you might just even say your name and speak into the microphone would be great. Thanks, Laura. You said my name. Hi, yes. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, you have a lot of rules in, in most countries in the world that last for hundreds of years or even decades. But what do you think? Do you think laws should be more fluid? Should they be kind of looked at maybe kind of on a yearly basis and changed with kind of needs of different communities or um, laws, is that laws yeah, yeah well I, I think that that uh, uh, we, we have a, a really great intellectual in the states uh, Cornell West and he said uh, uh, justice is what love looks like in public and so laws should reflect um, uh, love as well, you know, and, and hospitality. And so I think that that um, when we think of laws around uh, immigration or, you know, whatever they are, I think that, that that should be the framework and kind of the litmus test. And we're continually, I think, uh, re realizing and, and recognizing what uh, love requires of us and the responsibilities of what that looks like. And if Things like slavery uh, fit within um, uh, love and what love of neighbor looks like, you know. So I think it's really tricky because in the end, I think, you know, even when it comes to like the deep inequity between the super rich and super poor, you know, the fact that three people own the same amount as the combined economies of 50 countries, so like that, 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 um, I don't think that you can legislate love, and I, 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 no law can change a human heart, um, but I think that, that laws can create ways to protect people and to um, open the door to hospitality or shut the door to hospitality and, and love. So I, I think that, that that would be my my thought on, so, so that, that what we try to do is win over the hearts and minds of people and, and um as, as hearts change, then laws change, I think, you know, and, and I really think that that's certainly what um, is happening in our country, you know, like uh, I, I even, I, maybe everywhere, you know, but I think of, of um, apartheid, you know, and all these different things that have changed. I think a lot of it is because uh, uh, folks' relationships have changed and their hearts have changed. Um, and even like like with immigration in our country, uh, in the last election, one of the presidential candidates said, um, uh, "What we really need is an electric fence between the U.S. and Mexico that um, says, you know, cross this border and die." And uh, thankfully, a lot of Christians came out of the woodwork and said, eh, "That that doesn't really look like Jesus. That doesn't look like love, you know." And and uh, so I think we're in the middle of of some really healthy dialogue about um, how. Um, uh, how we are to love our neighbor as ourself and, and what that looks like when it comes to the issue of immigration or maybe a little closer to home, the issue of, you know, 30,000 Syrian uh, refugees, like do we welcome them or not? And, and uh, you know, I think we can suggest as Christians that, that we have a choice, an opportunity in, in these crises of whether or not we will welcome people and know that we're either welcoming or excluding Christ. Great. And just to say, we have Dr. James Gallon, James from Holy Trinity, who lectures in law in DCU, and, and he'll be on a panel later on, and you can also maybe contribute to that question, because you have all the answers, right, James? Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any more questions, guys? Uh, if we could just pass the microphone down to that gentleman there so we can hear what he's going to say, that would be great. Just the guy in the green behind yourself there. So, I've appreciated the... Um the Book of Common Prayer uh, that you put out. Um, I was wondering. It's if actually just Common Prayer, just for the sake of you know, not getting sued and whatnot. Yeah, sure. go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> I was just going to say, I saw the Archbishop standing there. Just <laughs> Behold, easy. I oh, know. <laughs> uh, for me, somebody who's moving from, uh, you'll understand, a more conservative American evangelical position 
to a more uh, kingdom justice oriented position. Um, if you could just speak a little bit to um, the interplay of the spiritual disciplines and justice. Mm. Wow, that sounds like we could have a six-hour workshop on that. But uh, I, I guess what, what the spiritual disciplines, I think, can do for us is they, they, they're kind of like uh, uh, exercises for our soul, right? They, they work our, the spiritual muscles. And, and so I think there's a reason that disciple and discipline share the same root. And that uh, to really follow after Christ means that we've, we've got to, and, and, and to be a person driven by love, I think we've got to work those muscles because it's not necessarily our knee-jerk reaction. So I, th I think part of what the disciplines do um, is it things like fasting or, you know, simplicity and solitude. Some of those things are, are ways that we can create holy habits um, that begin to um, allow the, the fruits of the Spirit to flow a little bit more naturally out of us, you know. And, and that's certainly been the goal of our prayer life and projects like uh, uh, the Common Prayer Project that, like, can create a fusion of prayer and of action so that we don't use prayer as an excuse for inaction, but we kind of couple them together. Um, yeah, and I mean, there's just so many great teachers on that. Our, our priest, um, we, we have an Irish Catholic priest actually in, in our parish, and, and he, uh, one of the things he says, I was going to try to use an Irish accent, which goes over great in the States, but when I'm here, I'm a little intimidated. So, um, uh, but um, uh, have a go, have a go, have a go. No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> I will not. Uh, Come on. No, stop I can't the do it. No. Uh, stop no. the camera. Stop the camera. <laughs> no. Okay. So anyway, um, so he says, what, what's the difference between uh, a flute and a stick in the mud? And he says, the stick in the mud is full of itself. But the flute has been emptied of itself uh, so that it can make good noise, you know. And, and I, I think that that's a really great way of, I think, I think capturing what the, what the spiritual disciplines are trying to do is empty ourselves so that we can be uh, filled with God and, and so that we can, you know, flow with God's Spirit. Um, and that for us, that means turning some stuff off, too. You know, it's not just doing new things, but it's turning, like, we, we, we don't really watch much television and things like that, so we've tried to, like, make space for real friendships and relationships and, and things, so. Mm. Okay, a couple of more questions just before we go for coffee, yeah. Again, your name would be really great, just so we can... Uh, Jake. Sure. Sorry. Um, so, uh, we were just discussing how, uh, you know, like, some homeless people, after a while, they will actually choose to be homeless because of you know, the sense community and uh, various other benefits uh, that I won't go into. But I just think that, um, you know, like a lot of a lot of people have kind of two kind of extreme reactions to as far as their approach to giving to them. And as far as, you know, either you give so much because it's kind of like an assuaging your guilt thing. And and then they can kind of see right through that as like you're treating them as a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, so that's like one extreme. And then the other extreme is um, obviously just not trusting any of their motives and just not giving anything. So I just wondered if there was practical ways as far as like, you know, talking with them and things that you can show them that you're not just trying to, you know, fix their problem, so to speak, and like, you know, treat them like an equal human being. Sort of, if you have like practical methods towards that or anything. I, I, it's really confusing, I know. But. Thanks, Jake. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot to your question, and I, I, I think, you know, you're certainly not saying this, but I think a lot of times folks say, you know, well, what if I, you know, give money to this person and they just buy alcohol with it or something? And I think it's really interesting because um, sometimes we, we, we have that perspective with homeless folks, but we're not consistent to have that perspective with, you know, CEOs or corporations, you know? <laughs> So what are they going to do with my money? I think we've seen what they do with our money. But, you know, anyway, I, but I think that um, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed by the, the endur uh, enduring patience of God. And th so I think we're invited to have that patience with each other. Um, and I'm certainly thankful that God's been patient with me when I continually, like, fall short of who I want to be. Um, and, and that love is persistent. And, and, and so I think it's not about the stuff. And you kind of alluded to that. You know, like you can, you can give money uh, uh, precisely because you want that wall to insulate you. You know, if you give, if you give a, a buck, they'll get off your back. And so, like, charity is just, it can, can be a way that we, we uh, 
insulate ourselves from the responsibility relationship would require. So I think when we build a relationship and we, what we are called to do is to, to give to everyone who asks. That's what Christ said. You know, I think that means that we give ourselves, we give our love, we give our attention. And as we build relationships, we earn the right to speak into each other's lives. Um, and with any friendship, I think that that's when it's received as well. You know, like if I come over here and you tell me I travel too much, I'm like, I might be like, well, you, you don't even know me. You know, if my wife tells me I travel too much, I better listen. You know, and so I, I think that, that like that's, you know, so I think part of what we got to do is we got to do the hard work to build a real relationship that, that gives us the, the credibility to speak into people's lives. And that, that's hard sometimes. You know, there, there's folks in my neighborhood that, like, I, I, they, they've asked me for a hundred bucks, and I'll give it to them on the spot, you know, because I know them, and I trust them, and, and there's other folks that ask me for a dollar, and I, I don't feel comfortable, because I know they're, you know, going to buy Lucy cigarettes at the store with it or something, so I, but, and I think that's not just with friends that may have financial needs, it's true of rich friends, too, you know, there's, there's rich friends that I don't want to take their money, because I, I want them to come and actually do something that is more costly, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I think we, we develop those friendships, um, but, but, uh, um, uh, the, the, the importance is that we're always trying to be driven by love. And in the end, I would say it's always best to, to err. If we're going to err, err on the side of generosity than on the side of suspicion. I, I just don't think that we're going to come before Christ and, 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 you know, Jesus is going to say, hey, you know what? You gave a little bit too much money to the alcoholics and the drug addicts, you, you know, uh, but probably that we will find out that we could have been a little bit more generous than we were. Great. Thanks, Shane. So, Anna, just one more before we break for coffee. Just pass that to Anna. Thanks. Um, um, Anna Mullen. Um, I had the privilege to be in Philadelphia 18 years ago. Right. And, uh, of course, during the day there were no homeless. And, 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 and in the evening a lot of men would come out, mainly African-Americans, I noticed, you know, with their big black bags, and they'll spend the night in the park and all of that. And when I was talking to... Um, my friends who were living there, they were saying that some people felt that it was the right to be homeless. You know, they, they liked the idea of being homeless. Like we have here um, people who are part of the traveling community, you know. And how, how do you reconcile? If somebody actually chooses, they want to be homeless. They think this is a life that they want. Uh, and then the law that they were trying to introduce, that maybe they were trying to prevent that, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, and how do you mean? Is there is any difference between somebody? Do you know everybody's stories? How what's their situation when you are ministering? Or does it does it matter to you if the people chooses to be homeless or ended up being homeless because of circumstances? Thanks for your question. I, I think of one one uh, guy that I I've known on the streets, and he says, "I just like sleeping under the stars," and everybody thinks I'm crazy. And boy, I mean, who might argue with that? You know, I think, but I think that's often the exception, you know, though that there are a lot of folks that are out there because of so many different reasons. I think the reasons that are pe people are homeless are often as, as diverse as the reasons people aren't homeless, you know, because of their, their family life or they've inherited this or that. You know, I think that so, so, um, but uh, the, 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 the importance, I think, that like, um, every person has dignity, I think, is, is what, what like, gets broken in all of these. And please, this wasn't just in Philadelphia. This was a pattern in 50 cities in the United States, right? And so, like, just one more example of that was in Atlanta, um, a lot of folks that were living in public, uh, either by choice or by situation, um, they didn't have public restrooms. And so, Atlanta police began arresting folks, and they were sometimes being charged with a sex offense for public indecency if they were using the restroom in public. That marred the rest of their life, that they would be a registered sex offender. And so the entire community in Atlanta, homeless folks and allies, really had a whole campaign that was... Uh, <laughs> It was called P for Free with Dignity, and they uh, <laughs> marched, marched with uh, toilets to the mayor's office, you know, and in the end, th that's why Atlanta has public bathrooms now, uh, public restrooms, and so I think, like, the, the point is that, that, uh, that, that I think a lot of times, um, whether someone's there for whatever reason, I think that they, they shouldn't be s so stigmatized that they are, you know, arrested or that they're, uh, and, and, and I, and 
I've met folks on, on the street that know the Bible better than me and uh, who feel a lot more connected to God by the, the, um, the way that they kind of live like the lilies and the sparrows, like in a way that uh, is, is mind-boggling to me, um, just in, in the same way that I've met many people on the streets who are deeply broken, uh, just as I am as well, you know, so... Um, yeah, so we, we, we can, as, as Mother Teresa said, we can meet Jesus in his most distressing disguises. And, uh, and, but we can also see folks who are, who, um, are trapped in, in addiction or, or uh, a mental illness and things like that. And so we, just, we, we try to continue to come alongside of folks. And, uh, and when we can, we welcome them in our home. And that, or, you know, like I think that, that uh, Dorothy Day was right. Dorothy Day of uh, the Catholic Worker Movement, you know, she said... If simply every Christian home made room for the homeless, then we would end homelessness overnight. If every Christian home made room for a child that wasn't their own, we would end the foster care system overnight. So it's a, it's a beautiful challenge. Not to say that those systems and shelters are unnecessary, but uh, in the end, I think the, the loving our neighbor has the capacity to really change the world.